We welcome the ruminators to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And we shall begin this morning with Jamaica has been upgraded to a hurricane warning. That's what the observer is suggesting here, that Jamaica upgrades to hurricane warning. It means, therefore, that it is probable, it's highly likely, that the hurricane will pummel, that's hurricane barrel, will pummel the country, batter the country, as it were. And uh, people have been praying. We have been hoping that the storm would not have been on its way to Jamaica. We lament um, what is happening, particularly to other Caribbean territories, such as Barbados, St. Lucia, Trinidad and Tobago, uh, Grenada, um, St. Vincent and the Grenadines. We've learned that they too have been battered and have been pummeled by Hurricane Beryl which I think at the time of passing could have been a category three or category four hurricane when it passed these Eastern islands. Now it's heading west and it's heading to Jamaica and also the Cayman Islands. So our prayers are with Jamaica. We hope that the government will um, definitely do what it needs to do to protect lives. But can we really depend on the Jamaican government? We know that they don't deal very well with crime and violence, right? And securing the lives of the citizens in Jamaica. So I'll save my breath for them trying to save the lives of Jamaica during that disaster. Already I'm seeing where, before I go even into that, let us read what the observer has to say about Jamaica being upgraded to a hurricane warning. Jamaica has been upgraded for from a hurricane watch to a hurricane warning in anticipation of hurricane barrel, prompting cabinet to structure its disaster response under the Disaster Risk Management Act, that's the DRMA. A hurricane warning means dangerous sea conditions associated with a hurricane are expected to spread across the island over the next 24 to 36 hours. The announcement came Monday after recommendations from the Minister of Local Government and Community Development, Desmond McKenzie, and the latest advisories from the Met Office. The DRMA grants the government additional authority to coordinate and execute a range of emergency response activities, ensuring a more effective and streamlined approach to disaster management. Prime Minister Andrew Fonis emphasized the importance of proactive measures as Jamaica braces for Hurricane Beryl, stating that the administration's main priority is, to, is the safety of the Jamaican people. And this is what he's saying, the Prime Minister of Jamaica, Mr. Andrew Fonis, and I quote, By invoking the Disaster Risk Management Act, we are taking a proactive stance to prepare and protect our nation against any potential threats posed by Beryl. The machinery of government has been mobilized and we are ready to respond to any eventuality. We will weather the storm together, Holness said. Will we? Mr. Holness lives in a mansion and Mr. Holness has access to state funds. I'm wondering if he thinks that Jamaica believes him that they're weathering the storm together when many of our people still live in shacks, right? Or homes that are not properly um, battened, uh, well, they're not, they don't have the, the, the facilities and the structures that would mitigate against serious hurricane damages. The government is urging all citizens to remain vigilant, make necessary preparations, and cooperate with authorities during this period. Regular updates and guidance will be provided to ensure that everyone is informed and prepared as the weather event approaches. So that seems that it is on its way. Hurricane Beryl is on its way to Jamaica. Seems that there is absolutely no um, setback at this moment in terms of the storm heading for that country. Um, we pray for Jamaica and we also pray for the, I think it might be going to the Bahamas also, if I'm not sure, and to the Cayman Islands, right? Because our prayers have to be with these people because we understand that this is a catastrophe, right? It's a disaster as it were. So let's look at what the Gleaner has to say. Um, I think the Gleaner had an article yesterday um, that was titled 
um, let me open it. Strange enough, the cleaner sometimes act weird. It's online edition of, you know. So let us me see here what it is saying. If not, we're going to move on to something else because sometimes the cleaner is very difficult to deal with when it's online. Let me see if I can click here on it. And it's taking some time to, to come up, to be loaded. Now, it says here that, well, this was an article written yesterday, burial upgraded to powerful Category 5 hurricane. So I'm not sure if it's going to be a Category 5 by time it reaches Jamaica. Right, so we have here that heightened concern, fears abound that the proliferation of multi-story apartment complexes, yes, I, yeah, all right. So let me repeat again. Fears abound that the proliferation of multi-story apartment complexes and high-rise commercial buildings in Kingston and St. Andrew in recent years could lead to a catastrophic scenes as, or to catastrophic scenes, I should say, as hurricane barrel barrels toward Jamaica. So all of these high-rise high buildings, and they're not properly maintained. Well, shouldn't say properly maintained, but they it, it, there was not there were not proper developmental goals and strategies and 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 um mechanisms in which you know these buildings might be able to stand up and remember now that it seems to me that you have tall buildings versus low buildings you don't know if they should fall they're going to fall on top of houses it's going to be chaotic we hope that that doesn't happen the center of burial was forecast to move across the southeastern and central caribbean sea on monday through tuesday and is expected to pass near jamaica on wednesday the looming weather system has sparked concerns among urban and regional planners who are wary that the uptick in construction across the capital city could lead to, to total to notable adverse consequences. So already we are hearing about these consequences, consequences that might befall Jamaica. You know, we never plan things properly. And I think there was an article in the Gleaner on Sunday, you know, which spoke about the high-rise buildings and the fact they are we building high-rise buildings to you know which are essentially you know favelas right um that is something you know I, i'm not really quoting the article act accurately but that is the gist of what that the writer of that article was suggesting was reporting was commenting on so that is for the government to answer and to deal with because oftentimes we do not plan properly we just simply like to follow what other people are doing, but we do not sit down, right, and plan thoroughly. That is a problem with the Jamaican government and Jamaican people at large. Now, this morning also, well, yesterday I saw this on TikTok, and it's, it is believable. It is something that was posted by the leader of the opposition, um, Mark Golding. And he's not Mark Golden, as some people are writing. He's Mark Golding, I-N-G, right? Many of you, sometimes when you are responding to my article, you are saying it's Mark Golden or Mark Golden, because you're saying Mark Golden, Mark Golden, right? It's Mark Golding, ding, right? So the it's I-N-G, right? So let's stop, you know, massacring as it were, right? The man's name, he's Golding, right? As Ing. So that is what is a Mark Golding. And let's listen. He's suggesting on the video that he is going to renounce his British citizenship because according to him, he has listened to the Jamaican people and he realizes that they are not particularly inclined to having a you know, future prime minister having dual citizenship. So on that basis, he has decided that he is going to relinquish his British citizenship. Now, in a former speech that he made some, could be a month ago or so, you know, the same Mark Golding did mention that he's not just going to give up his British citizenship because of some noise in the uh, among the people, right? He is going to he's going to renounce it based on principles. Now, based on what I understand, he thinks, and he did mention yesterday in his speech that the law does not prohibit him from running. But according to him, he thinks it's distraction where if he's going to run and people are going to be constantly referring to his dual citizenship, then the best thing for him to do is to renounce it. Now, from a superficial standpoint, it sounds very good, sounds honorable. However, 
we do know that our politicians are slick, they're cunning, and they're sly. So we're not sure if Mark Oling is acting as a sly fox who thinks that he's going to change his dual citizenship because you know he does he definitely wants to win the election and he does not want this dual citizenship contra um, controversy to be a distraction for him which will result eventually in the loss of the election for the people's national party we are not sure we cannot impute motive we cannot read people's minds so i am not suggesting that that's what he's doing but when we look at the history of our politicians and based on what he said in terms of the fact that Andrew Holis, his regime has been a disastrous regime. And I'm wondering, okay, how much more disastrous was Mr. Holis's regime than their regime, the PNP regime, who, you know, the PNP um, government was in power for many years, right? For many years. They were even vying for a fifth term in 2007, if we remember very distinctly. Now, I was listening to a Marty Perkins um, program some of the old programs um, that people have published on YouTube. And Marty Perkins was talking to a, a, a guest that he had on his program. And both men were talking about the fact that Mr. Buchanan uh, back then, so I don't know if it was 2006 or prior to then, but you know, in talking about the elections that were to be held in 2007, when Mr. Golding, that Mr. Bruce Golding won the election, JLP took that election in 2007, that Mr. Golding was, that Mr. Buchanan was suggesting that the PNP's fifth term was going to be for the people. So, Mr., which led Mr. Marty Perkins to ask this very important question, the critical question, if Mr. Buchanan was suggesting at the time that the fifth term that the PNP was seeking in 2007 would have been for the people, then all the former years, the four years, the four terms that they had prior to the fifth term that they were seeking in 2007, for whom was the vote? For whom was the leadership of the party? Was it for the PSOJ? oligarchy? That is an inquest, important question. And I wonder if we will ever be able to see uh, an answer, to, to see an answer um, advanced, right? I do not think that there will be an answer to that. But it's interesting that Mr. Buchanan, I can't remember his first name. I think he, at the time he was Minister of Information for the People's National Party. Right, somebody could correct me. I, I'm not living in Jamaica. I wasn't living in Jamaica then, so um, I was just listening to one of Marty Perkins' old programs, right? And he referenced that sort of uh, comment, that sort of intimation by Mr. Buchanan. Now, the fact is, if the PNP had that audacity to be telling the Jamaican people that you know, the fifth, four, the four terms that they had had before seemed not to have been for them, but they were hoping that the fifth term, and that would have been under Mrs. Portia Simpson Miller, right? The woman that came from the bowels of the working class, right? And that she was perhaps for the people. So it could have been a trick, you know, uh, politics, as it were, that they were playing and hoping that they would have... Uh, deceived, as it were, the Jamaican people. But, you know, thankfully, the Jamaican people at that time were deceived and they elected the government of Bruce Golding, former prime minister of Jamaica, and his team. Right? So that was interesting. And I think that had we lived in a society that was free, in which our press, right, the Jamaican press, um, were pursuing information I think that that would have been clarified as to why the PNP, what motivated Mr. Buchanan, then Mr. Buchanan, to have made such a ludicrous comment about the fifth term had the PNP won in 2007 being for the Jamaican people. So it means, therefore, that the terms, the four terms that they had had prior to 2007 were not for the Jamaican people. I am not sure if Mr. P.J. Patterson was on record of mentioning the same thing, but I'm sure that's what Mr. Perkins was alluding to, 
or um, was quoting from were the words of Mr. Buchanan, right? Uh, one of the then PNP um, political leaders. Something that is very interesting to understand. But let us listen to Mr. Golding here as he and the reasons for which he has forwarded, he has advanced for giving up his uh, British citizenship. Let us listen, let us see if we can listen to him and pay attention to what this man is saying. To address. It is also crucial to focus on and tackle the corruption, mismanagement, nepotism and waste that have unfortunately characterized the current government. These issues must remain at the forefront of our national discourse. By renouncing British citizenship, when it is not legal or constitutionally required for me to do so, I demonstrate and reiterate my unwavering commitment to Jamaica. At a time when we must focus on the critical challenges facing our nation, it also eliminates the potential distraction that political opponents have grasped at in the face of electoral defeat. Thank you for your understanding, my fellow Jamaicans, and thank you for your continued support. Let us remain united in our effort. Okay, so that is Mr. Um, what's his name? Mark Golding and his pronouncements about his renouncing, his future renounce, you know, renouncing of his British citizenship. And notice he's talking about corruption, nepotism, and waste that we have in government. And if we are to look at the PNP and their record, we know that that is a fact about the PNP and nepotism and corruption, right? And they, that they have not really been instrumental in building the, the, um, the Jamaican infrastructure right, and uplifting the lives of the Jamaican people. It is very evident to me, the more I read the history, the more you look at the politics in Jamaica, the current events that, you know, take place on that island, that our politicians are brazen, they're bold, and they are barefaced, as it were, and they don't care what they do or what they say, because at the end of the day, they know that if they should give out some pork barrels and, you know, just give some of the spoils to people, have some rum and you dance and you just have a lovely time, then they will not be held accountable. They will not be held responsible. And the media, that should be, you know, the guardians of democracy and the guardians of free speech and should be the channels through which Jamaicans obtain their news, right, and are being informed, are not functional. They are dysfunctional, right? They like to pre present themselves and they're collecting international awards for being one of the freest press in the world. But Jamaica is press is not free as they are intimating, right? A lot of things are covered up, right, and are hidden, are concealed, and Jamaicans are not aware of what is going on. The level of corruption in Jamaica is palpable, right? And it's almost like they're not even hiding it anymore because it is so brazen that why hide it? It's impossible to hide at the moment. So they are telling us that, look here, if you have in 2007, a political leader belonging to a major political party who can say that the fifth term in office had they won that particular term would have been for the Jamaican people. You are, you have to wonder, you have to wonder about the prudence, right, of our Jamaican people. Something is fundamentally wrong with the way in which our people think, particularly our leaders particularly our leaders. They're just good in terms of making speeches and they like to make platitudinous speeches and Jamaicans are impressed by that, right? And then they give you a little, you know, dollar here or there, you know, buck here and there, and then you are comfortable with that. You have not set high standards for your leaders. 
And even the academic and the intellectual class in Jamaica, they're just there to preserve the, and to maintain the status quo, right? When you speak to people there, they don't have a clue of what the leaders are doing. They will tell you they're doing their best, right? And you're talking about people who should be intelligent and who should be following the pages of history and doing some deep reflection and deep thinking. But they prefer to robotically repeat what the government officials and other intellectuals have to say. Repeat the exact same things, right? You can predict some of the statements, some of the, um, you know, intimations, as it were, that Jamaicans will forward you. You can predict what they're going to say, right? Because they continuously defend the government, even when they think they're not defending the government because they lack the knowledge and they do not want to move away from that false sense of patriotism. It's good to be patriotic, don't get me wrong. It's very good to be patriotic and to have a high sense of patriotism. But we cannot be so stupid that we are going to you know, look beyond our problems, right? Or intractable problems and think that patriotism and hide behind the flag or the banner of patriotism. Right, because it's open for people to see. It is open for people to see. Right, and we've got to deal with these problems. We've got to deal with our intractable problems and we've got to call out our leaders. We've got to let them know that we are intelligent citizens and that we will not tolerate nonsense. We will not tolerate the high levels of corruption in that island. Right, but the island is not being managed, right, for Jamaicans. Obviously, it is for foreigners and for the local indigenous oligarchy, right? These oligarchs, the private sector oligarchs, they're the ones who are running the show along with their international oligarchs. And there is nothing, it seems, Jamaicans are disempowered. They do not have the will, they do not have the knowledge to be able to fight back. And I'm not suggesting that you're going to be violent. Fight back could be that you're writing letters, you're letting your voice be heard, you are letting, you're just speaking out and let people know that, look, we know what's happening. We are seeing the high levels of corruption and you can specify, right? But the government understands that the majority of Jamaican people are not really, uh, you know, able, as it were, to follow the um the corruption that is a part of the daily staple, the daily diet in Jamaica. They understand that. That's why they keep the people in ignorance and they continue to do their um, immoral and dark deeds, right? So this is what I want to suggest on this video. The hurricane, as it seems, Hurricane Barrel is heading to Jamaica and we need to pray for Jamaica because we understand that this hurricane, if it should pummel Jamaica, is gonna send us back into the Stone Age, right? That is a fact. It's gonna send us back into the Stone Age because we have a collapsing infrastructure apart from the few highways that we have, right? And if the highways should be damaged, you know, in a very significant way, you know that we're going to have to pay huge tolls to use them after the hurricane has passed, right? Because that is how our government operates, right? And they have already sold you out. And the people who come there, the investors, treat Jamaicans like slaves, right? So you're going to have very high tolls and you have to pay it. And there's nothing you can do, right? Nothing that you will be able to do, right? You just have to pay the very high tolls because the investors are not going to, um, you know, absorb the losses that will be um, done after the storm has passed, right? That is how the show is run, right? That is how the system is designed. And our governments are not going to, to defend the interest of the ordinary Jamaican.
right? So that we pray. Uh, you know, I, I see somebody in the western part of the island, one of the councillors there, suggesting that we're ready. Ready for what? Jamaicans are not ready for any hurricane. We're not even ready for a storm. Not even for a category one hurricane or just a tropical storm. We are not ready for. No part of Jamaica at this moment is ready for even a storm, small storm. Right? Because of our collapsing and or dilapidated infrastructure. Right? So we are not ready as that councillor in the western part of the island is suggesting. Right? It's time for people to wake up and understand that we are heading on the wrong path. I've been saying that, I've been we are heading on the wrong path. And we've got to get back to basics, serve God, worship him, because we have become so hedonistic that we're following everything. And the more hedonistic we have become is the more curses that are falling up on the island, right? And everything is just, we're just moving from one drama to the next, right? There is no time that you have a peaceful society there. If it's not crime and violence, right? If it's not economic disaster, some sort of Tivoli Gardens invasion of, you know, of, of drug kingpin, not is a natural disaster. And if it's not dual citizenship, it is something else, right? This is just constant drama. There is no time of peace, no time to reflect about our problems in that country, right? And it, it, it's serious because if you really want to reflect about what is happening in Jamaica. You can't live in Jamaica. It's impossible to really live. You know, I credit Martin Henry for having lived there before he died, right? And he was able to write lucidly about our problems. He's one of the very few, right? Who have been able to do that. The large majority cannot because they are blinded to what they see happening there. You have to leave there. You have to look from outside within. Right to understand and to be able to put together, to put together and to contextualize in a very important way our problems. Living there will not help you to do it. It's very difficult. Not that you can't, but it's extremely difficult to do it when you are living on the island, particularly if you are you find yourself living comfortably. Right. If you're comfortable, then you say, you know, let me just wait and see. You watch and see what will happen because the government is doing all in the people's interest. But is that true? And one of the things I urge Jamaicans to do is to look from the eyes of the foreigner. If when you walk around Jamaica, pretend that you are a foreigner. What would you think about the people who live there? Don't think about you and the fact that you are Jamaican, right? But think about a foreigner landing for the first time on the island. And when they walk around the country, the length and breadth of Jamaica, and they see the level of disorder, the level of lawlessness, what would you think about that particular country were you not to have come from that country were you not to be citizen of that country. Think about it, walk around and think about it, write down the things that you see, reflect on these problems and ask yourself the question, are you comfortable living in this country, right? That is a question that you have to ask yourselves. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you will like, you will share, and you subscribe. And I look forward to posting another video. All the best to you. See you then. Adios.